Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Chenardin. I'm one of the liver doctors at Rush University Medical Center. Um, and I wanted to take this time to talk with you about um, the benefits of a healthy diet for people who have chronic medical conditions. As a liver doctor, I take care of a lot of people with chronic medical conditions. Um, and, but frankly, any chronic medical condition can often benefit from a healthy diet. Uh, the problem is that me just telling a patient, hey, eat a healthy diet, doesn't really do much of anything. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, through, through the ALF, I wanted to be able to give some ideas uh, on how people can take an approach to eating a healthy diet, certain tricks of the trade, uh, and see what they can do, uh, regardless of what their chronic medical condition is. So I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest pertinent to the matter uh, being discussed. Uh, and as an outline, we're going to talk about what are chronic diseases and what can you as a patient do about it. And, you know, based on the title, you should have the hint that what you can do about it is eating healthy. Um, we'll talk about which chronic diseases benefit the most from diet changes. And is there a chronic disease diet? Again, a little spoiler is that no, there isn't one chronic disease diet, but there are certain principles that you can follow to follow a healthy diet. Uh, we'll talk about what are the practical approaches that you can take that allow you to stay on that healthy diet. And if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about fatty liver disease, which is a disease, chronic disease that I take care of and obviously is near and dear to the heart of the American Liver Foundation. So what are chronic medical conditions? Um, they last over, it's a condition that lasts over three months. It can't be prevented by a vaccine or cured by a medication. And in general, they don't go away their own, like a cold or something like that. Uh, and importantly, they're often worsened or caused by health damaging behavior. So things like eating a poor diet um, or gaining weight um, or smoking for that matter. Um, so what are examples of certain um, chronic medical conditions? Uh, so on the top row here, I've listed a bunch of the metabolic chronic medical conditions. So things like heart disease and diabetes, these are the things that are associated with obesity and that's where we put fatty liver disease, uh, which is a condition, like I said, that I treat that affects one in every four people in North America. Um, as we'll talk, these are the diseases that we think are most affected by diet, but there are other diseases that are affected by diet as well, things such as cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, epilepsy, and even chronic psychiatric conditions. And I would just want to take a moment, like I do every time I talk about chronic psychiatric conditions, to make everybody understand that these are chronic diseases. So when a person is suffering from controlling their depression, it's the exact same as a person who's suffering to control their diabetes. And uh, it's important that we view it in that light. So these various diseases, these chronic medical conditions um, are, they represent a lot of the burden that we have in the healthcare system, not only in terms of, you know, the money that's spent in the healthcare system uh, and the efforts of the doctors and staff for, for treating these conditions, but also in terms of the burden that they pose to patients. So these are the reason for a lot of the, you know, decline in quality of life for our patients. Um, a lot of our patients suffer uh, greatly from these conditions. And so our job as physicians in general is to do everything we can to cure these conditions, is to do anything we can to reduce the burden that they pose to our patients. And so we're always looking for that magic pill. We're always looking for that one opportunity um, or that one therapy that would just treat everything and just make everything go away. And so what if I told you that that existed? What if I told you that there was a pill that could improve your diabetes reduce your cholesterol and triglycerides, which is circulating fat in your blood, that it could reduce fatty liver disease. The same pill could reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke and could help you lose weight. What if I told you it would reduce your risk of death and improve your mood? I mean, just hearing about this is improving my mood. Um, but, and what if I told you that there was a pill that could do all of these things? How much would you pay for that pill? And how hard would you work to get it? And if a pill could do all these things, would you be willing to deal with a few side effects? And more importantly, if you knew that eventually it would work, would you be willing to stick with this pill, even if it didn't work right away? Now, what if I told you a little bit more about it? And I said that this therapy, it was free, didn't cost a penny, and that anybody could have access to it, but that there was only one catch, that it's not a pill. Are you catching my drift? So. Uh, 
what is this magical therapy? And there you go, it's eating healthy. The magical therapy is eating healthy. It can do all of the things that I mentioned, reducing the risk of death, uh, reversing disease, uh, improving diabetes and, 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 and cholesterol, et cetera. Um, and so there really is no chronic medical condition that does not benefit from eating a healthy diet. But there are, as I mentioned, certain medical conditions that seem to be most affected by diet. And these are the metabolic conditions, uh, metabolic chronic, chronic metabolic conditions. So things such as heart, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. And in fact, they are all components of something that we call the metabolic syndrome. So the metabolic syndrome is a collection of disorders that um, if you have at least three of them, your risk of death due to cardiovascular disease has increased threefold. So you're three times more likely to, to die. Um, so the things that are contained within the metabolic syndrome are things like obesity, especially when you have fat that you gain on your midsections called truncal obesity. Having high blood sugars or diabetes is a component of the metabolic syndrome. Having high blood pressure is a component of the metabolic syndrome. And having abnormal cholesterol or elevated triglycerides is also uh, a component of the metabolic syndrome. So like I said, if you have at least three of these conditions, you have the metabolic syndrome and your risk of death is uh, threefold higher. Um, as a liver doctor, we take care of patients with fatty liver disease. And what we've come to learn about fatty liver disease, excuse me, what we've come to learn about fatty liver disease is that the fat that's present in the liver can turn into inflammation and scar tissue and can actually result in cirrhosis, can lead to cirrhosis, just like if you're an alcoholic or if you had hepatitis C. And in fact, so many people, one in every four people in North America have fatty liver disease, that it's going to be the number one cause of liver transplants in the next uh, several years, in the next decade or uh, two decades. Um, so it's really important that all of these metabolic conditions can be greatly influenced by the food we put into our mouth. Uh, and just to highlight that fact, I'm gonna show you an example in fatty liver disease. So this was a study where they treated people with 48 weeks of an intensive diet, exercise, and behavioral modification program. Um, and you know these people were given information about their diet, they were given phone calls to make sure they're sticking with their diet. Um, they were given information about exercise, but people had to do the exercise on their own. They were given tricks of the trade, you know, different behavioral modifications that they could do. Um, and in, in contrast, the control group of the people that they were comparing them to just got a book with some information in it. Um, so the people that were in this intensive diet and exercise program, uh, they had lost almost 10% of their body weight. And that is a very significant reduction in body weight. As compared to the people who just got the information, uh, they only lost 0.2% of their body weight. But it's not just that they lost weight, it's that they actually affected the disease. So when we looked inside the liver and looked at the amount of inflammation that uh, was going on in the liver, people who were in this program had a 72% 72 72 reduction in their liver inflammation as compared to 30% in the people who just got education. And more than that, a 7% weight loss in this program, which you see that most people were over 7%, showed um, people have a decreased body mass index that is um, decreasing the ratio of their weight to their height, but their liver test numbers, so their, their labs improved. They also had reduction in inflammation and a trend towards uh, even the scarring that was present in the liver, which we previously thought was permanent, there was actually a trend towards that scarring getting better. So it just shows you that diet, exercises, behavioral modifications, they can not just help you lose weight, but they can actually affect the diseases that people are trying to treat. So now everyone says, okay, great. It can actually cure my disease, I'm gonna do it. You tell me the diet to, to, to do, and that's where the problem runs into. You go online and you look for a healthy diet, you look for, hey, what's the diet I should use with chronic medical conditions, and it's nothing but confusions, because some diets say, oh yeah, cut out your carbs. And then other ones say, no, you don't have to cut out carbs, but cut out sugars. And then others say, well, ignore all that, just cut down your calories. And then lastly, people say, no, you just don't eat fat and you'll be fine. Um, and then it gets even more complicated when people are talking about, no, you should eat raw food versus cooked food, or you should just eat real food. And then there's all the various you know, fancy diets like the Mediterranean diet or the low cholesterol diet, the anti-inflammatory diet. And then there's these crazy things like tea cleanses that you, def you know, that people strongly, strongly recommend. And of course, everybody thinks that their diet is the best diet ever. And at the end of the day, people are left nothing but confused. 
So uh, even me, when I went through online and I was trying to look at these various diets, my mind was swimming and this is what I do for a living. Uh, so it's scary to, to when I think about my poor patients out there trying to sort through all these things. So which is why I don't specifically always talk about one diet. For fatty liver disease, there is a diet that we recommend. But when we're talking about healthy eating in general, I think it's important to be practical. Uh, and when you think about practical dieting, in fact, I should change the title of this slide to practical eating because it's not a diet, it's a practical way to eat. But you can take a, a, a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt where you have to be flexible, but stick to your principles. Maintain certain principles when it comes to your eating um, and then make sure that you stay flexible. Uh, so Michael Polian uh, is a journalist uh, at UCLA and he wrote an article for the New York Times called Unhappy Meals. And the first line of the article was eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That's really all there is to it. If you stick to that principle, you'll be okay. Um, but let's get into a little bit more detail. Um, I think you'd be very disappointed if you listened to a webinar and all they told you was eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So first talking about fats. Uh, so in general, people think that, oh my God, I should always avoid fat. Fat is so bad for me. But that's not always true. There are such things as healthy fats. And we're talking about the omega-3 rich fats. So these are very often fats that are come from a plant. So things like olive oil, um, canola oil, uh, avocado, or, 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 or nuts. Um, those are all omega-3 rich fats. And what we know about those fats is that they can actually re reduce the circulating triglycerides, which again are circulating fat in your blood. Um, and that's why a lot of people you hear about being on fish oil. So the fat that comes from fish um, is actually one of these omega-3 rich fats. And so people take fish oil supplements to reduce their triglyceride levels. So not all fats are bad for you. The other benefits of fats that are, uh, and the reason that they're incorporated in certain diets is that they can make foods instantly more satisfying. Um, you know, just in terms of the mouthfeel of the food, uh, and so it, by, by making the foods more satisfying, it makes it more likely that you're going to adhere to that, to that uh, food regimen or that diet. One thing you do want to be careful in general, we want to avoid non-fish animal fats. Uh, so, you know, red meats uh, in general, uh, trying to cut down animal fats is a good thing. But the flip side of that is that we want to be really careful with something that advertises itself as being low fat or no fat. Like I said, fats are what makes foods more immediately satisfying, makes them more palatable. So you have to ask yourself, how did they make that food still be palatable, but be no fat or low fat? And the way that they usually do that is by adding a ton of sugar into it. And we'll talk about the dangers of that. Next, let's talk about protein. The beauty of protein is that it makes you feel full. So people have done studies that looked at how satisfied are people when they have when they, excuse me, there's a train going by. Uh, so people have uh, looked at um, how full do they feel and how long do they feel full when they have protein versus carbohydrates versus fats. And protein seem to be the best at making people stay full so that they're satisfied and they don't have to eat again right away. And that's especially true with a protein-rich breakfast. The proteins that we're talking here about are, are lean proteins, things like fish, chicken, pork, and turkey. But again, you don't want to get fooled. Dark meat chicken, like chicken thighs, is often worse for you than a lean ground beef. Um, so you don't want to be absolute. You want to think about how much animal fat you're getting with uh, the various types of protein. The other word of advice I'd give is to be cautious with protein supplements. I recommend protein supplements to some of my patients so they can sometimes work as a great meal replacement. But some of the meal replacement protein shakes are packed, filled with sugar, especially some of the protein bars. So you wanna be careful with how much sugar you're getting with your protein supplements. The other probably most important component of a healthy diet is that you eat a lot of plants. You eat a lot of things that grow from the earth. <laughs> um, and so you wanna fill your plate with vegetables. Um, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables in general should be the biggest part of your plate. And more importantly, you wanna eat them first. You wanna fill yourself up with the healthy vegetables so that when it comes time to eating you know, the rich chicken dish you have, you're not as, you don't need to eat as much of it. Um, and the beauty of these vegetables is that they have fiber. And what fiber does is it makes you feel full. Um, and it also can bind up some of the cholesterol and fat that's present in your diet. Um, the other nice thing about plant-based foods is that the fat that comes from plants and the protein that comes from plants 
can have the same effect as animal aversion. So they can make your food more satisfying and they can keep you full, but not have all the downside, not have all the cholesterol or the trans fats that we try to avoid. Lastly, I want to leave, uh, I want to end with carbohydrates because carbohydrates and avoidance of certain carbohydrates is one of the most important things that you can do in your diet. In general, carbohydrates should be the smallest portion of your plate. You shouldn't have a plate full of rice and a little bit of vegetables on the side. You should have a plate of vegetables with a little bit of rice on your plate. And when you're choosing your carbohydrates, I want you to stick to whole grain or multigrain carbohydrates. So that means rather than having the white bread, stick to the multigrain bread. And it's all about how quickly these carbohydrates get absorbed into your system. Simple carbohydrates fly into your uh, system, cause massive spikes in blood sugar, which is obviously bad for diabetes, but also leads to bad outcomes for uh, fatty liver disease and heart disease. Um, so you want to avoid simple carbohydrates and sometimes the bleached and processed carbohydrates, the things that come in a box in your grocery store, those are generally filled with bad carbohydrates. You also got to cut down your sweets, right? I'm not saying, uh, I mean, my wife would kill me if I ever suggested that nobody ever eat a cookie from time to time. But in general, you want to you want to moderate the sweets that you have. And sometimes you can choose replacements. You can have a piece of fruit, you know, as your sweet at the end of the meal. Or you can have something like dark chocolate, which is low in sugar and high in antioxidants. The other thing that a lot of people are surprised is that I tell them to avoid fruit juice. People say, what are you talking about? It's fruit. It's natural. It's healthy. No, it's not healthy. And we'll talk more about this later. But by the same token, you want to avoid soda including diet sodas, which have been shown to cause weight gain, and avoid sport drinks, which are filled with sugar. So what is so scary about fruit juice? Why am I freaking out about that? Um, it's because fruit juice contains fructose. Fructose is the naturally occurring sugar that's present in all fruits. And it has really toxic effects on your body, which I'll give you the details of that in just a bit. Um, but when it's present as fruit juice, as soon as it gets into your intestines, it's quickly absorbed into your body. And once it's absorbed into your body, it has a variety of effects um, that uh, are, are frankly toxic for your body, leading people to ask questions like, are, is fruit juice just as bad as soda? Uh, and which is why we get very scared when we see things like the juice diet. Um, you know, when you were thinking about things like vegetable juices um, and other types of juices, those might not be so bad, when, but when it's high in fruit juice, high in fructose, including high fructose corn syrup, it can be very toxic to your body. Um, and why is fructose so bad? So I'll tell you why it's bad for the liver, but I'll also tell you why it's bad in general. So in the liver, fructose actually promotes liver injury and it acts at multiple spots in your body to do so. It acts at the brain, at the tongue, at the intestines and within the liver to promote injury and promote fat in the liver. Um, and specifically compared to even other simple sugars like glucose um, or table sugar, uh, fructose specifically increases the concentration of toxic compounds that are present in the liver and it impairs the ability of the liver to defend itself. Um, fructose also, as I said, promotes liver fat and promotes liver inflammation. Uh, when compared to other, uh, uh, when thinking about fructose in general, it also increases belly fat, increases triglycerides, causes uh, uh, the bacteria that's present in your intestine to overgrow, which can cause problems. It promotes diabetes and inflammation and also impairs your ability of fe feeling full. And as I said, no matter what you see on TV, high fructose corn syrup is just as bad. Um, okay, so I've given you a lot of information about the various components of food that you want to think about, but I want us to be able to be practical now. Um, how do you actually stick with the diet? Everybody knows what a healthy food is, but how can I be on a diet that, that I can stick with um, that allows me to just change my life for the better? And one of the things is I won't want people to starve themselves. Um, so starvation has a lot of bad effects on your body. You know, there are people that will do a one day fast or a three day fast. And in general, those are safe. But people who chronically don't eat breakfast and don't eat all day and then go ahead and have one giant meal, they gain weight. Um, and they have very, very bad uh, metabolic profiles. Um, and the reason for that is because when you're starving yourself, you are generally um, making bad food decisions. And that's not because you're just crazy or you're not motivated. It's because when you starve yourself, you have release of certain starvation hormones. There's two hormones, leptin and ghrelin, which are probably the best known. 
And when you have altered levels of these hormones, in general, your body wants you to have things that it can store, uh, so high fat foods, and it wants you to get things that give you instant energy, so simple carbohydrates. Um, so you don't want to be controlled by your starvation hormones. You don't want to starve yourself. The other thing that happens when you starve yourself is your body turns off. We all know we've been there when you don't eat breakfast and it's, you know, 1130 and you can't think straight. That's because your body is working at the slowest pace possible. In contrast, when people have multiple small meals, their metabolism rate, in fact, their actual body temperature is a little bit higher than people that are starving themselves. When you're in that starvation state and then you go and have a giant meal, your body can't use all that because your body's doing the least work possible. And so you get this huge spike in blood sugar, which is obviously bad for diabetes, but also all that extra sugar just gets stored as fat. In contrast, when you have multiple small meals throughout the day, you maintain a steady blood sugar and your body is working at its optimal pace. So when you do eat something, you use those nutrients rather than just storing them as fat. So what I thing I always tell people is to eat the healthy thing first. So have a salad. Uh, before your meal. And then wait five minutes. Let those starvation hormones go away. Uh, and after that, you can make much more intelligent decisions on how much of your food you want to eat. The other important thing to think about when it comes to diet and exercise is that we don't want this to be a diet. We don't want this to be um, a sudden crash thing that you do just to lose a bunch of weight. Frankly, it doesn't work. There's a thing called the metabolic thermostat that will always make you gain that weight back. But what we are interested in is in making lifestyle changes. Um, so these are certain principles for lifestyle changes that I always use. So it's important to know that this is not going to be easy, right? And, you know, like I said, the pill that, that cures all of those diseases, there were going to be some side effects and you are going to have to stick with it even if it doesn't work right away. So you're going to have to make sacrifices. But it's silly to cut out everything you love. You know, for example, uh, I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, and I love watching a football game and having a couple chicken wings. And if anyone ever took those away from me, uh, I think I'd kill them. So the approach to, 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 to lifestyle change is not to cut out everything you like, but to moderate the things that are bad for you. Work on portion control. So, you know, I'll sit down and have a full salad so my body is actually full and I'm satisfied and I don't have uh, starvation hormones coursing through my veins. And then when a plate of wings comes, I might have two rather than 10. So, um, you know, doing things in moderation and controlling your portions is a really important part of lifestyle changes. The flip side of that is that if there's some part of your diet that you hate, you know, you got to stick with it for a little bit. But if after two weeks you still hate it, there's no point in continuing it because it's just not going to be compatible with your lifestyle. But the, the other way that you can approach this is rather than worrying about what you can't do, think about what you can do. So think about finding a new healthy activity each week. So a new activity that makes you a healthier person, whether it's going for a walk after meals or incorporating a salad into each, uh, into each meal. If you do a new one each week and you add a new one each week, after 12 weeks, three months, you'll be a completely different person because you'll, do, you'll have changed 12 things about your life. The other thing that's important is you have to expect and plan for setbacks. We're just coming out of the holidays, um, well, relatively just coming out of the, the holidays, when a lot of my patients say, oh, doc, I, I fell apart during the holidays, and then they just gave up. What I encourage them is to expect setbacks and not worry about setbacks. You can't let a single setback derail your entire efforts. Um, so you have to know that there will always be a 4th of July, there will always be a Memorial Day, there will always be a Thanksgiving and a Christmas, um, and just plan for that. So the week of Thanksgiving, you know you're going to overeat on Thanksgiving, so try and be very conscious of the week coming up to it so that you don't have to feel guilty when you do have your setback. I don't want people to feel guilty for occasional indulging. I mean, we're human beings, and that is part of being a human being. So at the end of the day, I talk to people about diet and exercise and I tell them to find their shirt. And what does that mean? When you go into a store and look for clothing, when you try on a shirt, if it doesn't fit you, you say, hey, that shirt doesn't fit me. No one in their right mind ever says, I don't fit that shirt. It's a problem of the shirt, not a problem of you. And it's the same attitude that you should take towards lifestyle changes or diet. Um, when a diet or exercise regimen doesn't fit you, it's a problem with that regimen, not a problem with you. 
The reason it's a problem with that regimen is there is no such thing as a universal dietary regimen that works for everybody. Um, if there was, whoever invented it would be the most, uh, the richest person in the world. Um, but the difference is that when a shirt doesn't fit you, you don't walk out naked, right? You keep trying on shirts until you find one that fits you. Um, and it should be the same way with a diet program. So you might take one component from one program, one component from another program, and find the combination of things that make you a healthier person. Because walking out of the walking out without a program is just as unacceptable as walking out without a shirt on. Um, finally, the last bit of advice um, I'll give, and I think that we're running over, so we're not going to talk too much about fatty liver disease. Uh, but the last little bit of uh, advice I'll give is that you do want to talk to your diet when choosing a diet. Um, talk to your doctor when choosing a diet. Um, when you know when we take care of people with fatty liver disease, we often talk a lot about the Mediterranean diet. Uh, and that was the diet I was going to talk to you about um, because it does have benefits for diabetes and heart disease. Um, but specifically for heart disease, your cardiologist may tell you that he really wants you to stick with a plant-based diet. And the diabetes doctor may tell you that he wants you to follow a diet that follows more principles of the American Diabetic Association. So you do have to tailor your diet um, uh, to whatever chronic disease you have, and your doctor can help you do that. Um, just as another example of uh, you know, how much specific diets can make a difference, um, I'm gonna briefly mention the Mediterranean diet. Uh, just as an example of a lot of the principles. So this is a diet that follows the principles that we talked about earlier. It's a diet that's actually very high in healthy fats. 44% of the calories come from healthy fats. Uh, but again, they're high in the omega-3 rich fats, things like olive oil, avocado, fish fat, and nuts. It's high in lean proteins. There is carbohydrates in the diet, but this is actually a low percentage of carbohydrates, and they uh, focus on simple sugar, or they focus on very complex carbohydrates, uh, and they avoid the simple sugars. Um, just as an example, so this was a study where they studied the Mediterranean diet versus a low-fat and high-carb carbohydrate diet for people with fatty liver disease. And they saw that um, when people were on the Mediterranean diet, they had a 39% reduction in their liver fat compared to only a 7% reduction in this other low-fat diet. Um, and uh, their insulin sensitivity or a marker for diabetes improved with the Mediterranean diet, and there was no difference. Um, you do see here that there was no difference. There was no difference in the amount of weight that was lost by people on the Mediterranean diet and low-fat diet, a low-fat, high-carb diet. So it indicates that this might not be, you know, the Mediterranean diet might not be better than other diets at helping you lose weight. But specifically for fatty liver disease, if you want to reduce liver fat and improve insulin sensitivity, then Mediterranean diet might be a good option. And it's for these reasons that you want to talk to your doctor about what diet is best for your chronic medical condition. So in general, in summary, uh, the do's and don'ts of healthy eating for chronic uh, medical conditions you want to enjoy healthy fats, things that are omega-3 rich, avocado, olive oil, and nuts. Uh, you want to be careful with excessive animal fats. You want to stick to plant-based foods as much as possible. Um, you want to eat lean proteins, uh, and you want to focus on complex carbohydrates, again, in moderation, while avoiding simple sugars and high fructose corn syrup or any, really anything that's rich in fructose. The last bit of advice I give is as a liver doctor, I do advise you a lot of caution when trying to use things like weight loss supplements or detox agents, there is no liver detox agents, no matter what anyone will tell you, uh, including milk thistle. And the thing that we worry about these supplements uh, the most is, is that many of them have actually been associated with causing liver failure and liver toxicity. Um, it's because they're deregulated and you really never know what it is that you're taking. Uh, the other important thing, obviously, as a liver doctor, we want to avoid excessive alcohol, not just because of the direct damage it does to your liver, but for all your other conditions, the alcohol is a, is a huge source of calories. If you look at the average calorie content of, you know, a, a craft beer these days, it's very, very high, and two beers is the same as a Big Mac, for that matter. Um, so you just want to be careful about being excessive with alcohol use, both for the direct toxic effects of the alcohol, but also for the calories it represents. Uh, that's all for right now. We've way gone over our time. 
Uh, but I wanted to thank uh, the American Liver Foundation, uh, Jackie and Sarah, and the Great Lakes Division especially uh, for allowing uh, me to talk to you guys today. Um, these are all the wonderful hepatologists and transplant surgeons that exist uh, over at Rush. And if you have any other questions uh, or would like to meet and discuss this in further, we would be happy to see you. Uh, thank you so much for your time and I hope everyone has a wonderful day.